Berheloc Sol. I am Skaggy Vetter, and welcome to the Norse Code. Today, we're going to talk about Norse paganism. Now, there's a lot of different aspects of Norse paganism. We obviously can't cover all of them in a single episode. This will be kind of a general overview, and then we could dive in deeper to whatever it is you guys want to hear more of. So, to start off with, what is Norse paganism? Now, there's a lot of different definitions out there. So, the definitions I'm about to give you are as close to official as I could possibly find. So, to begin with, the overarching term is Norse paganism. This is a blanket term that covers all aspects of worshipping the Norse gods. So if you worship the Norse gods, you're a Norse pagan. You know, it's much like saying you're a Christian if you worship Jesus Christ. But there's a lot of separate things underneath. Catholic, Lutheran, Baptist, etc. So, let's get into those. The equivalent of Catholic for Norse paganism would be heathen. Now, back in the Viking era, they didn't have a term for their religion. Their religion was just part of life. So, there was no need to have a term for it. It wasn't until they started venturing off into other parts of Europe and they came across Jews and Christians and Muslims that they needed a way to identify their faith. And so, the term heathenry came about. Heathenry is the Norse Viking religion. To be a heathen, now I know heathen gets thrown around a lot nowadays, but the actual definition of heathen is someone who practices the Viking religion. Now, there's a couple different parts of that. You can break that down a little bit further. You have your your traditional heathen or, or reconstructualist heathen. This is somebody who practices the Viking religion as close as we can based on the archaeological evidence, the prose data, the poetic data, and all the other sources that we have. They don't go outside of that. If they can't prove the Vikings did it, they don't do it. They're trying to rebuild the original Viking religion, which in and of itself probably went through many iterations over the hundreds, if not thousands of years that people were worshipping the Norse gods. Uh, but then you have your progressive progressive heathen, your neo-heathen, your, your neo-pagan kind of aspect to it. These are people who follow the old ways. You know, they do what, to the extent that is practical, they follow what the archaeologists say that the Vikings did, what the sources say that the Vikings did, but there are holes in that. So the, the progressives fill those holes. They borrow from Celtic, they borrow from other Germanic religions, uh, they, they do, they'll make up things on their, on their own, for just what makes sense. They'll, they'll meditate, they'll pray to the gods and look for answers to expand their knowledge and then to grow it further to create a more modern heathenry. I don't think either way is bad. You know, if you're a traditionalist, that's great. Because I personally would love to know all the details of what the Vikings did. If you're more of a modernist, that's also great. Because you're taking the, a religion that more or less died out just under a thousand years ago and trying to refit it into the modern age which to an extent is necessary in my opinion so that's kind of the the main Norse paganism the, the heathenry that's the original but then you have a bunch of offshoots uh, for instance Asatru Asatru was developed it started being developed in like the 50s 60s with the, the hippie movement and the the resurgence of things like Wicca and Druidism and all of, you know, as the old way started to kind of creep back into our modern society, that's, this is kind of where Asatru grew from. 
Uh, it started in Iceland, and it became a recognized faith in Iceland and now in other places around the world uh, in, 19, in, I believe it was 1970. Early 1970s, if I'm incorrect on it being 1970. Uh, so, Asatru, which means faith in the Aesir, is a modern Norse pagan religion. It is a more structured religion than, than some of the others out there. Uh, it, it borrows upon other modern faiths to kind of build that structure, to build a church. And it is a very fast growing religion. Now, you might pick up on the term faith in the Aesir. Uh, Asatru hold the Aesir as, as the top gods. They, they focus on the Aesir. Now, there's also Vanatru. Basically, exactly the same, except they focus more on the Vanir. Now, I am not Asatru. I am not Vanatru. However, if I had to pick one, I'm going Vanatru. Uh, I, I personally, I have a much deeper connection to the Vanir than the Aesir. Uh, but there are tons and tons of books to, to even begin to describe in more detail. Asatru and Vanatru would take multiple episodes, multiple long episodes. Uh, but feel free to go out and read up more on Asatru and Vanatru if that's something that you're interested in. Now, me personally, I've read through it. And it's just, it's just not for me. And that's not to say anything bad about it, it just didn't resonate with it. Now, the, the last big Norse pagan group that we're going to talk about today is one that will only get this segment right here for me to talk about, and then they don't deserve any more of my time. And that would be the Odinic Rite, or an Odinist. Now, there's a lot of people out there who don't, who claim to be Odinists, who don't really know what an Odinist is. They don't necessarily follow the Odinic rite. But if they knew, I'm sure most of them would walk away from it, or at least stop using that term. The Odinic rite is a Norse pagan group centered within neo-Nazism. They are white supremacists that worship the Norse gods because they believe that the Vikings or the Aryans hated everybody else. And that's just not true. Did the Vikings have black slaves? Yeah. Did they have Asian slaves? Yeah. Muslim? Yep. You know what? They had a hell of a lot more white slaves. They didn't care, give two dams about your faith or your your, um, your race. If they conquered you, you're a slave. Simple as that. You were free labor. Didn't matter what your race was, didn't matter what your faith was. A slave is a slave. So for the Odinists to take what we hold as a very positive and uplifting faith and twist it into their evil ways, I don't like that. I don't subscribe to that. And they don't deserve any more of my breath. The last thing that I will say in the topic is there are a lot of of Norse pagan groups out there who are actively trying to separate the neo-Nazism away from Norse paganism because they use our symbols, they use our mythology, they use our stories to fuel their hatred and that puts a bad light on the rest of us. So please feel free to look some of these groups up. I can't remember any of the names off the top of my head. I probably should have looked that up before I recorded this episode, but what are you going to do? Yeah, things like the swastika and uh, you know some of the runes and Mjolnir and all the other symbols that the neo-Nazis and even the Nazis used, which were originally very good religious iconography, and now they twisted into something evil. Let's take back our faith. Let's take back our symbol, symbol yeah, symbology. No longer belongs to them. Let's take it back and give it back its original meaning. Okay.
I'm off my soapbox now. So, moving on, we've talked about the different types of Norse paganism. And, and there's a bunch of smaller ones that I didn't mention. Uh, the, these were just the big ones. Most people will classify themselves as, as one of those. There's a few other smaller sects here or there that, that do various things that, that, you know, are altered a little bit from, from what I just talked about. Uh, there's dozens of them. It'd be like talking about Christianity and trying to go through the hundreds of different subsects of Christianity. Really just hit the big ones. <clears throat> so you might be wondering where I fall in that line. I fall under Norse pagan. I prefer that umbrella term. Um, I guess I'd most closely go with a more progressive heathenism. Um, but I recognize other gods. I, I do have a couple other gods who are not within the Norse pantheon that I worship. So I just go with Norse paganism. I don't tie myself to any, anything else. It's just my personal choice on how I like to describe myself. So moving on. Oh, again, one other thing that I forgot to mention. There is a progressive modern heathenry church that just got recognized within the United States. The Temple of Northern Traditions, Church of Northern Traditions. Oh, now I can't remember. Sorry about that. The card in the camera got full and I had to go delete a couple things off there before I could continue. So where was I? The Fellowship of Northern Traditions. It is a new recognized Norse pagan church in the United States. They are actively raising money to create a great hall. I believe they're trying to do it in Kentucky. I don't know about that. Um, but you can find a lot of information on that on the YouTube channel Wisdom of Odin. Uh, Jacob does a great job in talking about a lot of the things I talk about here, plus a whole lot more. He was kind of an inspiration for me to start doing this. Um, but definitely check out the Fellowship of Northern Traditions. It's a great group. If nothing else, they're trying to bring Norse heathenism, Norse paganism to the general public and make it a recognized faith here in the United States. So, now, now we can move on. Once you start practicing a faith such as Norse paganism, you need to start thinking about the gods and honoring them and, you know, you have sacrifices, you have offerings, prayers, and what does all that really mean? Well, to begin with, honoring the gods. Unlike a lot of other faiths, you honor the gods by doing the best you can. You honor the gods by not asking for help. See, with Norse gods, they will help you when you're helping yourself. You prove to them that you are worth helping, they'll step in on your behalf. So if there's something that you want, you don't, unlike other faiths where you pray to your gods for it, with Norse paganism, you go out and start working for it. You know, if if it's you want a better job, you either go edu get a better education or go working towards the job that you want or start applying for stuff. Show the gods that you are doing everything in your power to get what you want, and then they will step in and do what they can to help you. That's how you honor the gods. You are here because of the gods, and the gods want you to show them that you are doing the best you can with the life they provided for you. And then they'll step in and give you everything. Now, that's not to say you can't ask the gods for help. There are certain things that are way outside of our control. And in those situations, asking the gods for help is totally acceptable. Let's say the weather, for instance. I don't know if it's showing up on camera, but it's starting to get kind of dark here. Uh, it wasn't supposed to rain this afternoon. So we'll see if I stay dry. But I can pray to Thor, prayer, or Ur, and, and ask 
that the rain's pulled off until I'm done recording this. The rain is outside of my control. There's nothing I can do to control the weather. So asking the gods for help in that kind of situation, totally acceptable. Asking the gods to intercede on somebody else's behalf, perfectly acceptable. A friend of mine was going through some bad times. She is a follower of Freya. So I prayed to Freya that she would step in and help her out because I couldn't. It was long distance, you know, there's only so much I can do. You know, it wasn't a monetary thing, so sending money wasn't really going to help. So I prayed for prayed to Freya to intercede on my behalf. And she did. She went in, she helped her out, she came back out, you know, on her feet, running forward. It was great. So, what else can you ask the gods for? You know, you could ask for anything, you just... If it's something you could do on your own, you should just do it on your own. That being said, you can, have, you know, have the gods look down on you favorably, not just by taking care of yourself and doing the best you can in everything you do, but through offerings and sacrifices. So, what kind of offerings? Personally, I often do mead for most of the gods. Um, Loki will occasionally get tequila because tequila seems like a Loki drink. And Skavi really seems to enjoy caramel vodka. So I will leave those out. Uh, typically I'll, I'll say a prayer, pour the shot, and then leave it for at least overnight. And then give it back to nature. I'll go outside say a prayer and pour out the drink. Uh, people have asked numerous times when you leave drink or food for the gods, do like, you, you just leave it there to go bad? No, of course not. You give it back to nature. The gods will take the essence from it. That's the offering that goes to them. And then the actual physical aspect of it goes back to nature. Uh, the same goes with any offerings that you might make, whether it be to Fae or nature spirits. In fact, in these woods here, I often give you know, offerings to the nature spirits that are here because they do a great job of protecting this place, despite the road that's way too close. Now, what kinds of offerings can you give? Well, as I said, there's alcohol. That's kind of the traditional one. Uh, you could also give food. Uh, for the Fae, I will always give something sweet as well as alcohol, especially on Beltane and Samhain. That's when the Fae move from their summer homes to winter homes or vice versa. <clears throat> uh, you could also give offerings of food to, especially if it's from your own garden. I, I personally prefer to give offerings from my garden because then it's more of a, not just an offering, but it's a sacrifice as well. You're taking something that you grew in your land with your blood, sweat, and tears, and you're giving it to the gods. Uh, I, especially with my blackberries, I do that. I get tons of blackberries, so I'm happy to take some of them and offer them up to, up to the gods. I will, I will always offer food like that in a place like this. I will find a place that feels special, that feels sacred, set up a little stone, uh, I will often take two small sticks and cross them, making the Norse rune of Gabo, which means gift. This way they know this is a gift, this is an offering. And I will place the offering there on that stone with the, the Gabo and sticks. Uh, and leave it. The, the gods, the spirits, the fae will take that essence, and then the squirrels and the deer and the rest of the animals will take the rest of it. Now, I don't give the animals alcohol. That I just pour out in the lawn after a, a little prayer. But that, that's how I typically do offerings. Now, you could do other types of offerings. Uh, Odin, god of poetry. Write a poem and then offer it to Odin. I like to offer it in fire. Things like that. I will have a little fire in my backyard, say a prayer to Odin, and 
burn the poem and allow the ash and smoke to take it to, to Valhalla, to Odin. Uh, if you worship Fenrir, this may sound a little weird, but I have offered duck bones to Freyr, to Fenrir. I have dogs, so I have milk bones. And Fenrir helped me out. Uh, I'll save that story for another time, but Fenrir helped me, and I thought I needed to offer him something, and the milk bone seemed like a good idea. It seemed to have been accepted, but same with the poem. I lit a fire, said a prayer to Fenrir, and offered the milk bone to the fire so that the smoke and the ash can take it to Fenrir. Now there's other types of offerings you can do too. Uh, you can offer pain to Fenrir, um, and he will gladly accept it. That has helped me out on multiple occasions. Uh, you can offer sex to Freya. Um, you know, the best thing to do is read the stories of the gods, learn what they liked, what they were involved in, what they didn't like, and then determine what is a good offering to them. You know fish would be good for Njord. Uh, cold and snow is good for Skadi. If you want to honor Skadi, take up archery. Uh, if you want to honor Ulur, you could also take up archery or skiing or hunting for that matter, if that's you know, your thing. There's a lot of offerings and the gods typically are not going to turn their nose up to an offering, especially if the intent behind it is to honor the gods. Now, sacrifices, typically they're going to be things from your garden, or you're going to give, you can give time to building a shrine, to even volunteering in the name of the gods you can do. Um, typically, we don't do animal sacrifices anymore. There are some who do. Uh, I don't. Most people I know in this faith do not. But an alternative to that is you can offer up meat. I, there's a farmer that I met who was a Norse pagan. And whenever he would butcher a cow or a pig, he would take some of the meat and offer it to the gods as a thank you. Uh, and human sacrifices, well, yeah, we don't do that anymore. N nor do I recommend doing that. Uh, and if you do decide to do that, I don't want to know anything about it. I'm not condoning it. That's enough on that. <laughs> um, so prayers. You don't pray to the gods the way you do to other gods of, diff of different faiths. They should be more... I kind of want to say complimentary, but... It doesn't seem like the right word. Um, if you're going to pray to the gods, you should praise them. There you go, praise. That's the word I was looking for. You should praise the gods. You should call them out. <clears throat> if they have multiple names, call them by multiple names. If they have titles, call them by those titles. You know, if they have deeds that they're known, of, known by, call them out by their by their deeds. For instance, um, Skadi, goddess of winter, woman of the mountains, wolf mother, uh, Thiazi's daughter, seeking revenge for your father's death. Come here now and protect me from this rain while I finish up this podcast. Uh, if you can't tell from the, on the camera, it is raining now. Um, but yeah, calling out, calling out to the gods, giving it very clear definition of who it is you're speaking to, <clears throat> honoring them while you're speaking to them, while you're calling them out, and then either asking for their, you know, asking that, that your offering be accepted. Um, asking for the rain to let up until you could get out of the woods or even just praising them, honoring them, and just leaving it at that. Uh, if you Honestly, this is going to sound kind of weird, but Pinterest 
is a great place to find prayers to the Norse gods. You know, if you go on there and you look for prayers to Odin, or prayers to Thor or Skadi, you're going to find a lot. You'll read through them. Some of them will resonate with you. Some of them won't. So pick a good one, print it out, and say it. I try to keep a collection of different prayers for different things and, and use them periodically as I'm you know, doing whatever it is I'm doing. Uh, another great website for that is uh, I'm blanking on the name. I'll put a link to the website in the, the description. Uh, but it is a site that goes through in detail some of the aspects of Norse paganism and the gods and honoring them and then they have digital shrines. This is places where people have put poems and prayers and rituals and offerings that you can go and look up and, and use in your own practice. Uh, I've done that multiple times myself. I just wish I could remember the name of the website off the top of my head. should have looked it up before this video. I'm a little ill-prepared, but I'll put the link in the description. You can go check it out. Click on the god that you want to, or the goddess that you want more information on, and you can find those prayers, those offerings, those rituals, those poems. And I have a few of them hanging on my wall just because I I liked the poems. I have some prayers that I save for various times. It is a really good way to kind of kickstart praying to the gods. And then you can always come up with your own as, as you go about your day. As you're, if there's something specific you want, you can make your own up. You know, there, there's no set traditional prayers like there are in other faiths. It's just praising them, honoring them, and sometimes just talking to them. Honestly, some of the best things that have come out of it were just from talking to the gods. You, you don't even need to do much. Uh, I, I'll typically call out to them. Um, Odin, Allfather, Desirer of Wisdom, hear me. And then I will talk. Have a conversation with them. Uh, every now and then they'll talk back which is really cool and a little unnerving, a little scary, but amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, Scotty has not talked to me, but she has made her presence known in other ways. Freya does talk, like actual conversations. Uh, Freya doesn't really talk, but you get feelings, you get you know she's there. You kind of get the gist just from emotion, feeling where she's heading in the conversation. Um, Odin, and, and this is all my experience, is not generalized for, for them. That You may have different experiences. Um, Odin's been very, very quiet with me. Every once in a while, he'll pop in, but for the most part, with me, he's quiet. But that's okay. I'll connect with him someday. But. So that's the that's the main points of, of Norse paganism. You know, you have the different aspects of paganism, honoring the gods, sacrifices and offerings, and prayers. So what more is there in Norse paganism? Well, there's being a good person, but that falls under honoring the gods. Uh, they're setting up altars. Setting up altars is actually a lot of fun. Uh, I have one in my spare bedroom. Uh, it started off as more of a Wicca type altar, but I've been been shifting over to purely Norse pagan. Um, and you can have candles and chalices and incense and crystals if you're into that and you know idols, statues, drawings, whatever. Anything that helps you connect anything that, that that space is for the gods and when you set up an altar that should be their altar 
you shouldn't use it for other things, which unfortunately I am a little guilty of. Uh, I run out of space. Sometimes I need to use that table for a little bit. Uh, but even a small little like the corner of your bedroom, a candle and an idol is all you need to create an altar. Just anything that will kind of allow you to escape everything else. Something that will allow you to be in the right mindset, uh, to pray, to offer, to worship, to meditate. Meditating with the gods is a great thing to do. Now, personally, I have to use guided meditation because I'm not really good at meditating in silence. But a guided meditation to meet deities, to talk to Freya or Thor, could be life-changing. It is definitely inspiring. Uh, there's lots of them on YouTube and Pinterest and other websites that you can go on to find guided meditations to meet the different gods. Highly recommend you do that. Meditation has a lot of health benefits anyway, even if you don't want to do one specifically for Norse paganism, just in general, uh, meditation is good for you. Um, but back to altars. Uh, I will show you my altar in one of these videos. I'll, I'll do a little altar tour. Um, I have, I have some friends that have outdoor altars, which is something when I buy, I'm renting a house right now. When I buy a house, I want to have a nice outdoor altar. Uh, but yeah, my one friend, uh, Pooch, who runs um, Nordic Wolf Carving, uh, an amazing carver. He does awesome totems and axes, really great work. Definitely go check him out. I'll put his link in the description as well. Uh, but he has this beautiful outdoor altar uh, set up in an old ash tree. Uh, he's, he's got a little hollow ladder hanging from it and, and uh, bones and idols. And he has things up into the tree. It's beautiful. He does his offerings and his rituals there. Someday <laughs> I'll have a good outside altar. Usually if I do something outside, I need it to be mobile. Set it up, do my thing, get out. I'm either doing it here or in the yard. Either way, I can't leave it. Um, what else is there? I mean, that covers the the bulk of it. That is the, the gist of being a Norse pagan. Um, if there's anything that you guys have questions on, feel free to reach out. I could either answer you directly or Maybe even do a whole video on the topic, if enough of you want to know about it. Uh, if there's other aspects of Norse paganism that I am missing, let me know. We can do a part two. Um, or if there's anything within the realm of Norse paganism, Norse mythology, or anything Viking related at all that you would like me to do a video on, please let me know. Uh, and until then, thank you for joining me. Please like and subscribe. You can find the podcast on, at this point, we should be able to get it on any of the podcasting apps. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube at The Norse Code. Uh, Facebook, also The Norse Code. Please like, follow, subscribe, and all that fun stuff. And keep an eye out on what more I have coming. And I do have some plans for this winter, some cool things that I'm going to do, things that I just haven't had time for during these warmer months. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So until next time, thank you and goodbye.